All right, welcome. Uh, it's 10 o'clock and uh, we're about to begin our webinar on spotted lanternfly basics for hops, uh, berry and vegetable growers. And um, I am Jan Hexter. I work with the Northeastern IPM Center and I am delighted uh, to have uh, some wonderful experts from around uh, New York State um, to uh, share with us about spotted lanternfly. I want to um, uh, cover a few basic housekeeping things uh, before we get going. And uh, just give me a second here to, there we go. Um, there is going to be a recording of, um, of this webinar. We also have uh, three other webinars coming up too. And they're all being recorded and they will be posted um, on our website. There's the link. Uh, but anybody who's registered for this will also uh, get a copy of the, uh, of the recording and um, or the link to the recording. It usually takes us a few days, um, so look for it uh, sometime early next week, probably it'll be up and ready. And uh, we absolutely welcome your questions. Uh, this is uh, a new area, and so I'm sure there are a lot of questions. And uh, we have places throughout the presentation where we can answer uh, your questions. What we invite you to do, um, since everybody is on mute, um, is to, if you scroll your mouse over uh, your uh, computer screen, you'll see there's a black bar that appears. And um, it's, there's in the kind of the middle of that black bar, there's a box and it says Q&A underneath it. And uh, we ask that you use uh, the Q&A feature for asking questions. Uh, the reason being is at the end, there will be a report that comes from Zoom that lists all the questions and who asked it and whether it was answered. And so it's easy for us to see if there was a question that you asked uh, that we didn't have a chance to answer. So if you can use that instead of the chat feature, that would be absolutely great. And if you just want to put comments in, the chat feature is great for that. Um, but for Q&A, if there's a question, please put it in there. And uh, you can also ask questions anonymously, so uh, you don't have to uh, worry about who knows <laughs> that you're asking a certain question. Um, okay, so our presenters today, we actually have another presenter uh, here who, um, uh, who's not listed on this slide. Um, so uh, today we have uh, Tim Weigel, who is the Grape and Hops IPM Specialist at the New York State IPM Program. He's responsible for extension, implementation, and applied research programming in Grape IPM for New York State and the Lake Erie region of Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome, Tim. And uh, Juliet Carroll, she's the Fruit IPM coordinator for the New York State IPM program. And she works with the uh, program to promote the use of IPM practices by fruit growers to protect their crops. She invented the track software, a pesticide spray record keeping program for market traceability and reporting. And we also have Ethan Allen, Senior Horticultural Inspector at the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. And uh, we finally have an additional uh, person here, Marion uh, Zufla, and I'll let you <laughs> tell people if I mangled your name. Um, and Marion is with the New York State IPM program, and she's the vegetable extension um, educator. And uh, so I welcome all of those uh, people to, uh, to the presentation today. And uh, we're going to uh, go today and, and look at spotted lanternfly biology and identification, uh, pathways and spread, uh, monitoring and management, then there'll be a regulatory update and uh, time for questions at the end, in addition to uh, after each of these um, pieces. And um, uh, before we do that, we're going to ask you some questions, just so we have an understanding of um, what you do or don't know already, uh, so that we can gauge the presentation. And, um, and also, for people who've been asking, uh, there is a certificate of completion that will be available um, at the end for people who, um, who uh, go through. And uh, so I'm going to launch the poll and uh, I believe there are seven questions. So if you could go through and answer those questions, I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes um, and then I'll let you know when it looks like everyone's had a chance to respond.
Okay, and I am not seeing that people are responding to the poll. So I'm just checking, is it, is it viewable? Is it clickable? Okay, so oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> maybe folks are reading through the questions and then answering, which is a fine way of doing it. Um, okay. Yana, this is Julie. Uh -huh. And at the end of my poll, it says host and panelists can't vote. Yes. So is that is that normal? Is that okay? Is that why you're not getting the votes in there? No, I am getting the votes in now. I think people just were reading through. Uh, so you you and I can't vote, but everybody else can. So perfect. And, and when it's ended, uh, folks will be able to see that. We have about 120 people on the call, so I'm just going to give, um, and people are coming in, I can see that now. So I'm just going to give us a couple of minutes to, uh, for, to give people a chance to respond. We've already got one question uh, that I'll just throw out while we're waiting for the poll, and that is, will organic management of Spotted Lanternfly be covered on this webinar? Kind of. Not necessarily specifically organic, but we will be talking about some biocontrol that um, is being researched. All right, we seem to be slowing down on the responses. So um, I'm just gonna give us 30 more seconds and then I'll end the poll. And folks can be able to see the uh, responses. Okay, so we've got about 76% of uh, people have responded. Uh, so let us uh, end the poll and you'll be able to um, see uh, the responses here. Um, so in that first quick question, um, I'm not going to read them out actually. I'll uh, just scroll through and, uh, oops, share the results. I need to do that, there we go. And uh, you'll be able to see. And hopefully during this presentation, there will be the correct answers to all of these. <laughs> it looks like that very last one had a pretty even spread of uh, the best resources for information. So, um, and uh, there was quite a spread actually in uh, what you should do about reported sightings too. So uh, hopefully that will be it's something that we're going to cover. So um, uh, let me stop sharing and uh, close that out. And uh, there we go. And uh, Tim um, is going to uh, uh, go take us through this next section on biology and identification for spotted lanternfly. Okay, good morning. Yeah, you can tell by the questions that part of this, or at least some of it is a little more focused on New York State than the surrounding states. Um, but I think that the information that we're going to provide today on spotted lanternfly is applicable across um, the United States. So um, looking at the poll, some of you have already either had to deal with spotted lanternfly or have been reading up on it. Um, spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper. It's native to China and Vietnam, where it typically is not a huge problem over there. Um, it, can be problems during certain years that favor its development, but typically um, it isn't that bad. We have seen where it feeds on over 70 plant species in the United States. In fact, talking to the folks down in Pennsylvania, and I do want to mention that the um, researchers and extension people down at Penn State University and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture have just been wonderful at sharing the knowledge that they are gaining on this pest with us. So wouldn't be able to put this presentation together without their help. 
Um, it feeds on over 70 plant species, but really from what they tell us, it will feed on anything as it is moving to try and find its preferred host. And so that's why we have four webinars is to try and hit all the commodities so you're aware of it. Um, it may not be a huge problem in your particular commodity or crop, but um, chances are that you will see it eventually. It's a phloem feeder. So it's going to drill directly into the phloem and pull the sap out of the plant. And they're swarm feeders. So it isn't typically where you're not going to find one or two. You will find a mass of them um, feeding on the crop. The life cycle, typically one generation per year in the cooler areas that we're in. Oh, sorry, Jan, I need to tell you to switch <laughs> slides. OK. Um, so we'll have one generation in the, where we have winters. Um, they do not need cold temperatures, though, which is why um, you know in New Jersey, the, somebody bought a Christmas tree that had spotted lanternfly on it, took it into the house, um, actually an egg mass, took it into the house, set it up, and as it warmed up, the eggs hatched, and they thought they had ticks on their Christmas tree, and it turned out to be first um, in star spotted lanternfly. So you can see right now, October through June, we have egg masses. That's what we're um, primarily going to see. Um, of anything else will be dead, like the adults. And then we have four end stars. The first three end stars are black and white. The fourth end star turns red. Then the adults come out in July through December. And then you get egg laying September through December or the first hard frost, depending on where you're located. So right now, as I mentioned, um, spotted lanternfly, oh, go ahead and go to the next one, Jana. So the spotted lanternfly overwinter as egg masses. You can see the on the left-hand side there, um, two spotted lanternfly adults laying their egg masses. Well, they've laid their eggs, now they're covering them with the putty. On the right-hand picture, you can see the eggs almost look like seeds. They lay them in a row about an inch long and then cover them up with the putty. There's about 30 to 60 eggs per mass. Um, it'll start out, the putty will start out white. It turns pinkish brown. And then you can see um, over on the right-hand side there that it will start to crack, um, turn white. It almost looks like a splotch of mud. It's very difficult to see on certain substances. They tend to lay their eggs on anything. They say smooth surfaces, but they seem to enjoy rusty metal, like box cars or old burn barrels, things like that, um, underside of the trees. But when populations get large enough, they will lay their eggs on most anything and anywhere. Next slide, please. So the first to third end star, as I mentioned, um, they're black with little white spots. They're about, start out at an eighth inch long with the first end star, and then they'll get up to three quarter inches long um, by the time they get to the third. Next slide, please. And you can, when you get into the fourth end star, um, they start to get some red coloration in there. And typically with insects, if they have that red coloration, that is a warning that they are noxious or they taste bad. Um, so any predators that happen to be around will not eat them. And we see that there isn't a lot that will eat um, spotted lanternfly. Next slide, please. So the adults are about one inch long. They have, um, what? Well, if you look in the upper right hand corner of the slide, you can see the red underwings there that has been one of the photos that has been out and people have identified as spotted lanternfly. Typically you will not see that unless they're in flight or they're startled. The photo on the left hand side in the lower right um, is more typical of what you'll see of a spotted lanternfly adult. Um, they will have their wings closed with the black spots and again they're about an inch long. Next slide please. Okay, so how do they feed? Why are they a problem? As I mentioned, they're phloem feeders, so they have this piercing, sucking mouth part. Um, I think if you hit it again, Jana will focus in. There we go. There's the um, straw-like mouth part that they use to insert into the phloem. The fourth end star and the adult have a strong enough 
mouth part that they can go into um, second year shoots, tree trunks, um, the canes and trunks of grapes, and will then pull directly out of the phloem. They'll pull that sap. The first three end stars do not have a uh, hardened enough mouth part, so they all feed on first year growth. So they're pulling out the phloem, they're pulling the sugary sap out of the plant. Um, they're really not looking for the sugar though, they're looking for amino acids and nitrogen. So they need to expel a lot of the sugary sap that they're pulling in, and we call that honeydew. It's basically the sugar water or sap that comes out. Um, and honeydew is just a really nice name for insect poop. Um, the spotted lanternfly does not have, oh, you can go to the next one. So this is, you can see where they have the straw-like mouth part going in. Um, the spotted lanternfly does not have a really good pumping system for that piercing sucking part of it. And so they really rely on the turgor pressure of the plant so that they think the researchers are looking at that and they think that might have something to do with um, what plants the spotted lanternfly feed on at different times of the year. Okay, next please. And I think we're at the question. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we are, sorry. Uh, great, so uh, Nancy, do we have any questions that have come in? I only have one question and it is, do multicolored lady, beeble, lady beetle attack this pest? They do not, but I was down when I was down in Southeast PA in the quarantine zone. I noticed that they are around the spotted lanternfly, or at least in the places I was looking, but they are actually um, feeding on the honeydew of the, from the feeding, not feeding on the critter itself. There are very few things that actually feed on um, spotted lanternfly, and the thought is because they feed on Tree of Heaven, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, there are some toxins that are involved there, so they seem to have an off taste and could be noxious. I just got another one. What does the poop look like and do they feed on fruit? Um, okay, they, they do not. They're phloem feeders, so they're not going to feed on the fruit. They're going to feed directly on the canes and shoots and trunks, yeah. um, where the fruit problems with the fruit come in um, like hops or blueberries or is going to be where the honeydew hits the fruit and then um, sooty mold comes up. But if you look, it's going to be just like sugar water is what the honeydew looks like. And if you're standing underneath a tree full of spotted lanternfly and you look up, it'll be just like being hit by rain. Great, thank you. Well, let's move along to the next section. Uh, pathways and spread and Tim you're guiding us through that one too. Okay talking about pathways and spread let's go to where it started. Um, it started in Berks County in southeast PA. They figure it that came in with a shipment of stone from the southeast um, Asia and started in Berks County and you can see that they didn't they figure it got here in 2012 but it wasn't noticed until 2014. So in 2014 you can see the yellow in the center there. Um, they put a quarantine in place trying to stop the spread but you can see that 2014, 15 is orange, 16 is the blue and then 17 is the green and what this indicates is not necessarily that it's countywide but there are spots within that county that has infestations and if you look at that and say wow they really you know the quarantine didn't work um, if you think about uh, southeast or south korea which is about the same size as pennsylvania they had an infestation that came in and within a year it had spread throughout the entire country so really the efforts that Pennsylvania is putting toward this and USDA and all the groups involved, um, they really have done a very nice job of trying to contain this until we get enough information to try and stop it um, using the different IPM methods available. Okay, next please. Okay, so the, um, it's reported that the population can move three to five miles a year on their own. So you see where that quarantine is moving out. However, um, we wouldn't really have to worry about it if 
all they did was fly or crawl or hop. They're really good plant hopper. They're really good hoppers. Um, the adults are okay flyers. They're poor landers, but they can fly fairly decent. Um, however, most of the movement is due to them being excellent hitchhikers. I mean, right now we're worried um, mostly about the egg stage. This time of year, we're only worried about the egg stage. Um, so if you're getting anything from the quarantine area, you want to make sure that when it comes up, you're looking very closely at that. And I think Ethan's going to talk about that a little bit later in the regulatory part. Um, adults and egg masses are the most common life stages that hitchhike, just because we mentioned that they'll lay eggs on almost everything. Um, adults will fly around. They'll fly into bins of apples. They'll fly into the backs of trucks that are being loaded. If you leave your car doors open or the windows down, they'll fly in there. And if you think about it, if it just one mated female makes its way into your vehicle and goes wherever you go and lays its two egg masses with 30 eggs a piece, that's 60 spotted lanternfly that will get started in the process. Then within two years, we may be where Berks County was in Southeast Pennsylvania. So it is moved by human activity. You wanna check anything coming out of the quarantine zone for any life stages. Um, we actually have a checklist on the New York State IPM spotted lanternfly website, um, which tells you some of the things that you should look at and inspect before taking it out of the quarantine zone. Next slide, please. Okay, mention the adults and egg masses are the most common forms, but you don't want to forget about the nymphal stages or the first four instars, because here you can see that it, um, for whatever reason, they are collected on a tire of a piece of equipment that's getting ready to get moved out of the quarantine zone. Next. So right now, as of January 2019, and we just heard yesterday, a um, couple folks, Betsy, who's on the line here, let me know that they had found a dead spotted lanternfly adult in Boston, Massachusetts, that came up with some poinsettias um, from the quarantine zone in Pennsylvania. So you can see the red dot there is where it all started. The blue are the New York State external quarantine areas, which Ethan will talk about, and the little red line around the different areas in Pennsylvania and New Jersey are the state-imposed quarantines in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. But you can see that um, these yellows are where Spotted lanternfly were found, but it was found not to be through surveys, found not to be infestation, but um, an isolated hitchhiking incident. Next, please. Okay, so one of the pathways um, is Tree of Heaven. We mentioned spotted lanternfly will feed on 70 different plant species, but it strongly prefers Tree of Heaven. So. I really didn't know anything about Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven has been around um, in the United States. It was introduced into Philadelphia in 1784 and California in the 1890s. So it's pretty much spread across the United States. And I had never really looked for it, but I did notice that um, I have it in my backyard. It grows in the same areas that um, sumac will grow in. One of the ways that you can tell the difference between it, um, it has the compound leaves. You can see here that there's like 30 leaflets here. There's a yard stick, um, but it's got smooth leaf margins and it has lobes at the base of the um, leaflet. Early on, the bark of the tree will look like um, cantaloupe almost, and there are male and female trees. So you have the female will produce samaras um, as the seeds. And so they, those are wind dispersed and you can get quite a grove growing in a short amount of time. I did some research and about quarter mile away from my um, house, there is a gorgeous um, tree of heaven, female tree that produces hundreds of thousands of seeds it looks like every fall. Okay, next. 
So keys to correct identification of Alanthus. And the one reason that we're talking about this is because Alanthus is a great way to monitor for this pest. Um, so if you know where your Alanthus are, you can go out and check it on a regular basis to see if spotted lanternfly uh, is being attracted to it. So the leaf margins, as I mentioned, Alanthus is smooth. There's no teeth. Um, or serrations. Native species like uh, staghorn sumac, black walnut, hickory, um, the leaves are all serrated. If you look at the leaf scar on the shoot, um, Alanthus has a really large leaf scar on there. And one of the most telling traits is a foul order, odor, excuse me. When you break the foliage or crush it, um, it's smells like uh, rancid peanut butter, or somebody has says the bottom of a box of Cheerios, um, but it just has, it puts off an odor that is very distinctive where the others, if you look at some of our native species, if you crush those, um, you just get a vegetative smell. Next, please. Okay, so plants at risk. As I mentioned, all plants are at risk. Um, they've found it in blueberry plantings on basil, in alfalfa. Um, Brian Walsh from Salix Landscaping down in North or Southeast PA told me he saw the first in star nymphs feeding on grass as they were trying to move from one area to another. So the plants that they've found it on, um, grapes, apples, and hops, from what um, Heather Leash down at Penn State has told me is if you look at grapes, apple, and hops, it's kind of in that order. They will prefer, if they have the choice, they'll feed in grapes, um, then in apples, and then in hops. They really haven't seen a large problem in hops down there, but I think in the absence of grapes and apples around, you might see it problems in hops. Ornamentals, the lumber industry, not so much that they're going to be feeding on the lumber or even on the Christmas trees, but the fact that they're gonna lay eggs there and then um, you can have a problem with moving those commodities. Residential shade trees, um, they'll be in Alanthus feeding in the tree of heaven. And then in the fall, they tend to move to shade trees. And the maple industry, um, it seems that they prefer silver maple over red maple and then sugar maple is the least favorite of the three. Next. Okay, so we talked about what does honeydew look like? So you can see the glossy leaves on the left-hand side, that's honeydew from a large population of spotted lanternfly excreting the honeydew down. Um, this is at the base of one of those trees. On the right-hand side, and you can see that there's some sooty mold growing on there too, that's the black um, substance. And on the right hand side, you can see a fungal mat that has formed from them. That's due to them piercing the trunk and the sap coming out there as well. And then you get fungal mats that will form with heavy feeding. Next. And it isn't just crops that we're worried about or different commodities, but it can impact your quality of life as well. If you look at the Photo on the right, those are spotted lanternfly adults on a black cherry tree in somebody's backyard in Berks County. And on the left-hand side is a the steps going up to a deck in somebody's backyard that has a high population of spotted lanternfly. The top two steps have been covered in honeydew and the sooty mold has started growing. And you can see the bottom step they took a power washer to it and were able to get some of that off. But the folks down in Berks County, if they have high populations in their backyard, have said they've felt like prisoners in their own home because they can't go out after August, September when the honeydew production really starts up. And we'll go to questions. Great. So uh, Nancy, are there any questions that have come in? Yes, there are. Uh, is there evidence of them affecting chestnut? I have not heard that yet. What are, what are the few things that will eat them? You said that not many things will eat them. What are the few things that will uh, eat them? They have seen stink bugs, praying mantis, spiders, um, are the, some of them, some of the biocontrols that we've seen, but not at a level 
that um, will provide control just because of the sheer population that you tend to see with this pest. Do all instars and adults prefer the host tree of heaven or are adults more attracted to the host? They all will feed on tree of heaven. And lastly, does the honeydew have a smell? Um, you know, I don't remember the smell. It's more if there's the, you start getting the fungal mats. So it's the obligate um, organisms that start growing on it that have the smell as opposed to the honeydew itself. And I just got one more, uh, a couple more. I'll go as long as you tell me. Uh, any systemic insecticides used for other tree pests effective at controlling any of the stages? Um, we're actually putting together, the New York State, State IPM program is putting together a list of um, materials that are labeled for spotted lanternfly. So um, Dan Gilrain on Long Island is looking at the ornamental side of it. And um, so we'll have that out shortly. We're not only coming up with the list of insecticides, but also trying to get efficacy data. So um, in New York State, it's a little different. Um, they're doing quite a bit of work down in Pennsylvania, but in Pennsylvania, only the site needs to be on the label. Whereas in New York State, we need to have the pest and the site. So right now there's no spotted lanternfly um, listed on any of the insecticide labels. So we're trying to get some special labeling. It's called a FIFRA 2EE, which will allow us to put spotted lanternfly on those insecticide labels. And we hope to have those available um, by April when spotted lanternfly starts coming out. So check out the New York State IPM website um, as we get closer and we should have those listed for you. Are train cars coming out of Pennsylvania being inspected? Um, I will leave that to Ethan to answer during his regulatory update. Okay. Great. And I should probably, we should probably move on. Okay. So we'll have, we have a couple more chances to answer questions. So um, we save those for, for the next uh, Q&A period. So. Um, so let us move on to uh, monitoring and management. And uh, Tim's going to lead us through that one too. Okay, so good news, um, with the exception of where we showed um, in New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, there are no infestations that we know of. Oh, I'm sorry, and in Virginia as well. Um, but there's no infestations in New York State. So really right now, what we're looking at, instead of looking at what materials do we have to spray against them, we're really looking at trying to limit our exposure. So um, knowing how to properly identify and report all the life stages. Um, Ethan will be talking a little bit about how they respond to the reports, I think. So, I mean, we've been really good at, people have been able to find the spotted lanternfly when it comes in, know what they're looking for, and then reporting it. So New York State Ag and Markets and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation can react to that and see whether or not there's an infestation there or if it's just um, a regulatory action or isolated hitchhiker type of thing. So identify all life stages. Um, you know, as I mentioned, monitoring for the pests is the most important management strategy that we have right now in areas where there aren't known infestations. So monitor vehicles and shipment from the quarantine areas um, for all life stages of the pest Right now we're worried about eggs, okay? And identify tree of heaven in your area to help you to monitor for these pests. Next. And talking about knowing your pests. So there are some insects that resemble lanternfly. Um, mentioned that the folks thought they had ticks in their Christmas trees um, when the first instars came out. So um, know that Usually the ticks don't have the white spots on them. Um, you can see green stink bug nymphs there. Um, different stink bugs will look similar to the spotted lanternfly nymphs. Next. So if you find spotted lanternfly in New York, and this is gonna be different. I know that there's some folks from other states here as well. Um, 
it's going to be different depending on the state that you're at, but most every state now in the Northeast has um, a place where you can report findings or spotting spotted lanternfly. But in New York State, you're going to want to take a photo. If you can put a coin or something by it for to show the size, um, take that photo and report it, send it by email to spottedlanternfly at dec.newyork.gov. And if you find any spotted lanternfly, um, you know, get it, kill it, place it in the sealed bag and dispose of it in the garbage or throw it up in the freezer. And then when the folks, once you report it, the folks from DEC or Ag and Markets will come and they'll take a look at it and help you to determine whether or not it's actually spotted lanternfly. So for more information, you can visit the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation website. You know, one of the questions was, where's the best source for information? You know, you can go to the DEC website, um, go to the New York State IPM website. Basically, any of those answers that you did were correct because we're trying to make the dispersal of spotted lanternfly information as easy for you to get as possible. Hey, Tim. And, and since we're on this uh, slide, Tim, if there are folks from other states, uh, what's the best uh, way for them to find out uh, how to report it in that state? Actually, if you do spotted lanternfly, if you Google search spotted lanternfly followed by your state, then you typically, at least that's what I've been doing, and I usually come up with uh, the method of how to report it. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, just real quick, Tim, um, we definitely want people to retain that specimen <laughs> for us. This is Ethan Angel from Ag Market, so that we can we can have that specimen and look at it and then send it off for positive identification. So if, if anybody finds spotted lanternfly um, in New York or in other states, retain that specimen for uh, those folks that would be responding. Sounds good. I'll change that slide. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. So management, looking ahead, you know, the question everybody asks is, you know, well, what can we spray for it? And as I mentioned right now, we're lucky that we're not at that point where we need to spray for it. Um, but there really aren't that many insecticides, if any. We have some FIFRA 2 E recommendations, and that's where I mentioned you add the pests to the label. So we're getting more of those available. And also in New York State, we looked um, for a database of insecticides labeled for plant hoppers. We found some that were labeled, um, not necessarily the most um, effective materials, but we are moving ahead on that. Okay, next. So we did um, some of the work done down at Penn State. Um, we were able to take the work, Dave Bittinger has done quite a bit of work um, on insecticide trials in tree fruit and grapes, along with Heather Leach and Emily Schmeyers, um, who is working with Dr. Julie Urban. Um, so we have some materials and you can see that we're starting to get those. We're trying to do this for as many um, crops and commodities as we can. So we're we're going that direction. Somebody had asked about organic materials and none of these are organic. We are looking at those. Some of the materials that are labeled for plant hoppers right now are some of the um, beneficial fungi. Um, so I didn't look to tell you the truth whether or not those were Amafra approved, but we will definitely do so. Okay, next slide, please. So frequently asked questions. Is spotted lanternfly a vector for viruses? Um, you know, some of the crops that worry about the viruses. That's a question. And right now, um, there really is not a concern, at least researchers have not found, that um, these plant hoppers are ones that will move viruses around. Another question is, are there biological control agents available? Um, next slide, please. So researchers have been looking at this question and what they've found is that the gypsy moth parasitoid, um, the little wasp that lays its eggs inside of gypsy moth egg masses, will also lay its eggs in spotted lanternfly egg masses. Um, it was not reported on spotted lanternfly in China, 
but they did find it in Southeast PA. Um, you know, it's not great, 7% parasitism of the egg masses, but of those in those egg masses, 20% of the egg mass were parasitized, only found in some locations. So there's research going on to see if maybe they can ramp up populations, how they can get those um, back out because they did do a pretty good job helping to control the gypsy moth population. Next. Um, and so researchers are going over and doing foreign exploration back in its native country. So they've gone over to China and they've found an egg parasitoid there. A. orientalis is widely distributed throughout China. Um, parasitism range from zero to 92% of the egg masses and anywhere from zero to 26% of total eggs. So again, it's not something that's gonna give you complete control, but if you start stacking up the different biocontrols uh, and you might be able to get this down to a manageable level. Um, right now it's in quarantine in Massachusetts. And the thing is, we don't wanna just bring these over and say, oh, it works in China. Let's bring it over here. They have to make sure that we're not gonna cause a bigger problem by bringing it over and having it attack some of our um, desired insects. Um, so it's in quarantine right now. And hopefully we'll have it in three to six years. Next, please. And again, here's the Dryenus brownie. And it attacks second and third star instar, second and third instars. And you can see that it overwinters in a cocoon. If you look at the lower right hand picture, um, there's a white sack hanging out of the instar there. And that is the cocoon um, with the parasitoid inside. And it is now in ARS quarantine lab as well. So it attacks the second and third instars. We have egg instars. Next. And then fungal pathogens. So we're adding something else to the mix here. Research by Dr. Ann Hajik at Cornell University. She's looking at Bavaria species. Um, when I was down in Southeast Pennsylvania, it was interesting that is just naturally occurring down there and was attacking a small part of the population without any additional help from us. So there's some thought that we might be able to help that along increases populations. And then there's an unknown fungi that's closely related to Entomophaga species. Um, it's believed to be related to the gypsy moth fungal pathogen. So there's hope there as well that between the egg parasitoids and the fungal pathogens that we might be able to get a biocontrol program going so we won't have to spray as much. And that takes us to more questions. Great. Uh, okay. Um, some of these go back to the previous section. So if spotted lanternflies will lay eggs on hops, will they also lay them on hemp? Um, you know, I don't know if they will actually lay them on hops because typically hops are harvested, depending where you're at, hops may be harvested prior to the egg laying period of spotted lanternfly. So that is going to really depend on where you're growing your hops. Um, I think the only, from talking with Heather Leach, um, looking at apples, hop, and grapes, the only crop there where she saw egg laying was in grapes, where they would lay it on the trunks, the cordons, and also the posts within the vineyard, but she did not see it happening in the other crops. So I think if you're, what's that? I'm just gonna go on to the next question. Uh, well, I was gonna say, so I think if you have a hop yard, you're probably looking outside the hop yard at where they would be laying eggs. So the, the question was actually about hemp. If they lay them on hops, will they lay them on hemp? Yeah, and I- Don't know. I, yeah, I can't answer yeah. that. Could the maple industry be negatively affected? Maple syrup yes. industry? Yes, that's one of the things that they're looking at. Um, as I mentioned, I think it was um, silver maple, red maple, and sugar maple. So if the sugar maple is the only maple tree around, um, it can, it is considered to be um, 
a concern from what I've been talking to folks. Right now, I think it's low on the list of maples, um, especially early in the season because um, when you're, you know, pulling your sap out um, in early season, those nymphs or instars aren't, don't have a strong enough mouth part to actually attack the trunk itself. When you talk about the quarantine area, exactly what does that mean? Um, I think I'll let Ethan handle that one. Will they colonize areas that don't have tree of heaven? That is one of the things that research is doing is to see if they need tree of heaven to complete their life cycle. And so they're looking at different plant species to um, see what is needed to complete their life cycle and if tree of heaven is actually a component of that. Great. And then we should move along uh, to our next section. We also have more time for uh, questions after this. So if you still have a question out there, don't worry, it will get answered. And um, so Ethan uh, Angel is going to be um, delivering the next section and the regulatory updates. So go ahead, Ethan. Thank you very much. So uh, you'll notice on these slides that it lists uh, New York State Ag and Markets as well as Department of Environmental Conservation. And the reason for that is, is that both agencies are responsible for the response to spotted lanternfly here in New York and coordinating that response. Um, and there's a number of other organizations and, and uh, agencies that, are, that have been involved, uh, most notably USDA, uh, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historical Places, New York State DOT, and of course, uh, the folks here at the IPM program that are hosting the webinar, as well as Cornell Property Extension and the Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. So just it's a, it's a collaborative effort to try and battle uh, spotted lanternfly. And, and the thing that I'm going to talk about is the regulatory aspect of what we're doing here in New York. So next slide. So I know there were some questions about quarantine. What is a quarantine? I think the thing that I want to stress uh, to everybody on, on the webinar is a quarantine is not as what most people think of it. Uh, when you talk about a, a, a health issue and you quarantine somebody that has a particular disease or something, um, they're in quarantine, they're in lockdown, they can't move out of that quarantine. Plant pest quarantines are significantly different. And what we do on that is we designate an area that we know to be infested by the particular plant pest. And then we establish um, rules and regulations for the possible movement of what we would consider regulated articles. And regulated articles are things that can further move or spread the particular pest. Um, in the past, with most plant pests, that's been pretty simple to identify. So for example, emerald ash borer, we know that emerald ash borer will attack ash. So any ash, firewood, lumber, logs, nursery stock are regulated articles. With this particular pest, it's much more complex because you heard Tim speak about how spotted lanternfly can attack over 70 different species of plants, as well as lay its eggs on not only plants, but a whole host of other things. So really what we're trying to do with the quarantine is prevent the movement, the artificial movement of spotted lanternfly out of those designated areas into New York. And we'll go to the next slide so we can talk a little bit about the quarantine area. So this map that was produced by uh, the New York State IPM program shows a whole bunch of different things. But the thing I want to focus on with respect to quarantine is that blue area. And that blue area is under quarantine by New York State. And we consider this what we call an exterior quarantine, which means we're placing a quarantine on other states because of um, their infestation. So any of those blue areas, um, any commodities or what we consider regulated articles coming out of there would require a certificate of inspection. Now you'll also notice that there's some red lines in there. Those red lines indicate that those states have placed quarantines on themselves to limit uh, and prevent the movement of spotted lanternfly, not only within their state, but outside of their state. So you'll notice a couple of things of concern here. Virginia has an infestation, but no quarantine in place. And again, that's their right. As a state, they can decide whether they wanna place a quarantine on themselves or not. Delaware has an infestation and does not have a quarantine. They are in the process of putting a quarantine on themselves. It's open for public comment, and you'll notice New Jersey and Pennsylvania have put a quarantine in place. So let's talk a little bit about what this means for New York and, and, and the states that have infestations. Next slide. So the quarantine area specifically is not the entire state, and this is a misconception by a lot of folks out there, is 
you know, they hear, oh, Pennsylvania is under quarantine. It's not the entire state of Pennsylvania. So for Pennsylvania, and this is coming right out of our regulations, this is New York state regulations. So if you're in Pennsylvania or in other states and you're trying to cooperate with those state quarantines, you'll have to refer back to those states and their quarantine regs. But for New York, the quarantine area consists of the following counties. So in Pennsylvania, you can see we have 13 counties listed there and I'm not gonna read them all off. In Virginia, there's only one county that's listed as of right now. And in New Jersey, um, there's three counties. And then in Delaware, there's only one county listed as of right now. Those are the counties that we're regulating that say, if you're bringing something out of this area or you're going down to that area and then coming back into New York, that's when the regulations come into place and, and you'll need certain things. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. So we talked a little bit about regulated articles and I've highlighted a couple things here. Spotted lanternfly itself is a regulated article. So if you, if you have it in your vehicle, if you have it in your truck, that itself is regulated. And you heard Tim mention the uh, IPM checklist. That's very important. You want to go through that checklist. But you also want to check yourself when you get into a vehicle. Um, I was down in the quarantine area uh, this summer, and we were out looking at spotted lanternfly, and we were instructed before we got into the van um, to check ourselves to make sure that we didn't bring spotted lanternfly into the van. All of us checked ourselves very thoroughly, got into the van, and as we exited the van, when we reached our, reached our destination, which was still in the quarantine area, there was a dead spotted lanternfly found on the bench in the van. So it's very easy for this insect to attach itself to people, to other things. It's a great, it's great at um, hitchhiking. Um, the other thing that's highlighted here is landscape remodeling debris construction waste. As Tim mentioned, it will lay its eggs on just about anything. So um, we have found it moving on landscape nursery stock that's a concern. Um, construction waste is another concern, uh, though we haven't seen it moved on construction waste, but that is uh, something that should be noted. Um, packing material, such as wood crates or boxes or pallets. One of the things that we've seen in the quarantine area is that um, as the adults are out and they extend late into the season, they get a little sluggish because it gets cold out. And so they seem to try and get under um, pallets that are wrapped with shrink wrap um, around stone, brick, things of that nature that have heat in them to, to warm up. And so that's another concern is looking at packing material that's associated with shipments coming in. Um, again, all plant material, anything that's an outdoor household article. So if you have a grill, if you have a boat, a camper, um, you know, shovels, anything that sits outside where spotted lanternfly can have a chance to lay its eggs on, that's regulated. And then Again, we have this catch-all down at the bottom here that says any article or commodity um, that we reasonably believe might be infested or harboring spotted lanternfly is then considered regulated. So what we wanna focus on is anything that's exposed to spotted lanternfly that could either vector the pest itself or the eggs of that pest. Next slide. So this section, again, this is coming out of part 142 of the regulations. This talks about what's required to move into New York and through New York from those designated areas that we defined as quarantine above. And again, just to refresh everybody's memory, we're talking about specific counties in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia. To come out of that area, you need a certificate of inspection. Um, that's our terminology. That's how it's defined within the regulation. But down in Pennsylvania and other states, they call it a permit. As long as it meets the definition, we'll accept that. And in this case, Pennsylvania's permit does meet our definition for certificate of inspection. So don't get too hung up on the wording within the regulation of what we title it, as long as it meets the definition. And the definition of a certificate of inspection is something that's issued by that state saying that that material is free to move out of the quarantine area because it doesn't pose a risk. Um, one of the other things too that's highlighted here is that you have to be accompanied by a way bill. So when you're coming through the quarantine area, if you have um, product in your vehicle or in your truck, you have to have a way bill stating where it came from and where it's destined to. And the reason that we have this provision in here is because we do do checkpoints along the side of the road with our partners at New York State DOT, as well as New York State Troopers. And we're looking at you know, commercial traffic coming out of the quarantine area, and we're trying to determine where things are coming from, where they're going to, did it come from a quarantine area, should it have, a certificate of inspection, 
Is there a risk to its destination? Those types of things. Um, and then, of course, if you're moving through the quarantine area, but you didn't, your, your, your regulated article didn't originate from the quarantine area. So let's say you're coming from North Carolina and you're traveling up through the quarantine area and you're destined to New York. As long as you don't stop in the quarantine area, um, you don't need a certificate of inspection. But if you do stop, um, besides refueling and traffic conditions, let's say the, the, the trucker wants to stop for, um, just for lodging, then he, would need, he or she would need a certificate of inspection because that vehicle has remained too long in the quarantine area and has now been exposed to spot and lantern fly. So I know this gets a little tricky and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible around this stuff because regulations can be a little confusing and we wanna try and make it as clear as possible for everyone. Next slide. So one of the biggest questions is, who do I go to and how do I obtain a permit or a certificate of inspection? Do I go to New York State Ag and Markets? Where do I go? So in this case, no, you don't come to New York State Ag and Markets. You go to the state of which um, you're either picking up a shipment from or where that shipment is coming from. So shipments that are coming out of Pennsylvania would have to go to Pennsylvania to get their uh, certificate of inspection or permit. Same thing in New Jersey, Delaware, and Virginia. And right now what's happening is, is that Pennsylvania has an online permitting system and there's some agreement of reciprocity um, from state to state that if you have the Pennsylvania permit, then that will satisfy the requirements of New York and New Jersey because everybody's doing commerce um, in each other's state. So the, the uh, Pennsylvania permit is probably the, the gold standard in terms of permitting and, and that's what we're encouraging most people to get. Um, it's very easy to obtain. You're gonna go to the, new, go to the uh, Pennsylvania agricultural website that's listed right there. And you'll see on the, um, on the link on the left side of the page, there's a link for Spot and Land Reply. You're gonna click that and then click on the quarantine box and then do the training. And the training is an online training uh, that's hosted by Penn State University. You go through that training, there's a test at the end. Once you satisfactorily complete that, they'll ask how many permits you want for your business. There are some limitations um, on how many permits can be issued and how many people have to be trained. So you'll have to wanna adhere to that. But once you have that permit, then, um, and you agree to the terms of that permit, you would be able to move uh, your product out of Pennsylvania. Next slide. So one of the other things that we wanna <clears throat> highlight here is um, sh shipment inspections. We do look at shipments. So we look at shipments when they arrive at their destination. We also look at them um, while they're um, being transported in commerce. Um, we do this, um, uh, with Customs and Border Protection coming down from Canada. We do this on our borders for all different types of issues, but we've been specifically focusing on spot and lantern fly. And one of the things that I also wanna highlight is, is that if you're receiving any plant material to line out for your hop yard, for your berries, whatever it is, your, your, your vines, whatever it is that you're getting in, um, all plant material that's arriving into New York State is required to have a certificate of inspection for just general plant health. That's a, a law that's been in place for a very long time to protect New York growers from plant pests coming in. So you should be checking for that as you get stuff to line out. Um, the other thing that you should be checking for is if it's coming from those areas that I identified earlier in the presentation, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, those areas that are infested, you definitely wanna make sure that there's some sort of paperwork that signifies that they're under permit and that they can move that out of Pennsylvania, okay? And then lastly, when that plant material arrives, you wanna double check it if it's coming from those areas to make sure that there isn't any spotted lantern fly as well as any plant material, check it when it comes in, make sure that there aren't any insect or disease issues. If you get a shipment in and it doesn't have the appropriate paperwork or what you believe is not the appropriate paperwork, contact us. We wanna know about that immediately so that we can follow up with that state and that shipper to get them into compliance so that we don't have them accidentally vector spotted lantern fly into New York State. Next slide. So really take home message here, learn to identify all life stages of spotted lantern fly. Um, this particular pest has been uh, incredibly successful by the public to be able to identify, um, much, much more so than other pests. Inspect all the items coming out of the quarantine zone, okay? If you're visiting the quarantine zone, inspect your vehicle inside and out and everything else that you're bringing with you, whether it be a boat or camper or anything else. And if you report it, as Tim mentioned, we want, or if you see it, report it, as Tim mentioned, we want you to report that to the Spotted Lantern Fly at DEC 
www.ny.gov in New York. If you're listening in from another state, contact your state department of agriculture. As Tim said, if you Google search, you'll find, find a point of contact. Some states have phone numbers, some states have emails, whatever their point of contact, please contact them and retain that specimen because somebody's going to follow up with you. They're going to want to come out and they're going to want to take that, uh, that specimen to get it identified. Um, and, it, and it's incredibly important to be able to look at the specimen because we want to know, is it a female? Was it a gravid female? And if so, was there an issue that possibly she could have laid eggs, which cr could create another infestation? So, and again, um, there's a ton of IPM resources around spotted lanternfly. Please look at their page, utilize those resources. They're there for your, for your use and for your assistance. Terrific. Okay, and um, so we are actually at 11 o'clock, and so what I'd like to do is um, uh, run another poll, uh, which is uh, based on the one that we did in the beginning. And, um, um, all right, uh, hold on two seconds, I, I'm new to doing this. Um, okay, there we go. I can launch the poll, and then um, I could ask you to answer these questions, and also at the end, uh, there's an opportunity for you to ask for a certificate of completion um, for the webinar. And, um, and also, uh, we'll stay on the line and, and continue answering questions so that all your answers are complete. But I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to, uh, to do this. And it would uh, help for us to understand uh, the impact of, um, of the presentation on your working knowledge. And, uh, we're all based at Cornell, so this is giving you a Cornell experience today. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to uh, to go through and um, and uh, give your responses to, uh, to 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 these questions. Okay, and I'm just going to give 30 more seconds for people to complete that. It looks like we have 64, 65% of you. Uh, so I'll just give it a couple more minutes now, seconds here. So we're at seventy-one percent, which is kind of what we were last time. So I'll end the poll. I'm going to share the results, and, um, and I'm just going to ha ha allow you. Okay, so we all understand now. Splotch of mud. <laughs> that is a clear winner on that one. Um, okay. And uh, for those of you who have said that you would like um, a certificate of completion, um, I will send out an email um, later uh, today, um, for uh, sometime in the next couple of days, uh, with a link to a certificate for you to download um, uh, for, the, uh, for the presentation. And um, there's a couple of little housekeeping things before, um, um, before we 
uh, let me click here um, before we complete. Uh, we have a, a place on our website for the Northeastern IPM uh, where you can find colleagues um, who are interested in similar topics or doing research. And if uh, you're interested in uh, posting there, you can <clears throat> put a photograph, a short bio, your name, your contact information as a way of us um, promoting uh, collegiality throughout the region. And uh, there will be uh, today's webinar will be posted on our website and I'll send you an email when that is uh, ready. It will be sometime in the next week. And uh, we also have other webinars coming up. Uh, we have another one this afternoon for grape and uh, apple industries and um, next Monday for Christmas tree growers and for nursery, greenhouse and landscape industries. And uh, so you can also register for those if you haven't yet. And um, or feel free to spread word uh, throughout your networks. Um, if you found this valuable, please feel free to share it uh, with your colleagues and other people you might who might find this interesting. And um, we also need to uh, and thank uh, the source of our funding, which is uh, NIFR at USDA, and um, obviously Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, New York State Ag and Markets, and uh, the New York State IPM program. So uh, with that, we will just uh, go back and uh, were there any questions that have been left unanswered, uh, Nancy? There are plenty of questions that have not been answered. So uh, I will just go through them as they came in. Will Great, and I, will, I just want to mention that uh, all of the presenters agreed to just stay until the questions were answered because we expected to have quite a lot. Um, so, um, so just to know we're not going to select and then cut off after five minutes, so, okay. Will eliminating Atlantis on your property or bordering properties improve the risk of attracting spotted lanternfly to farm crops? I don't really understand that question. I do. <laughs> that, actually, that's a really good question, and it's um, one of the things that they're researching. There's been some um, information coming out of the quarantine zone in Pennsylvania where the grower said he eliminated Alanthus from his property and he thought that he saw a decrease in spotted lanternfly um, attacking his vineyard. But there hasn't been the research to show that that um, is the case. And there's also been concern expressed the other way that if you eliminate Tree of Heaven, as you mentioned, if you eliminate Tree of Heaven, are they going to then preferentially feed on the crop that you're trying to grow? So that's still kind of up in the air. That's, um, I think there's quite a bit of research going on. Um, you know, it's a kind of two-edged sword. There's, you can only do so much research because it is in the quarantine area. We don't want to bring it up into New York just so we can do research on it. Um, so we're really reliant on the folks down in, in Pennsylvania to help us out with that work. And of course, there's only so many researchers and extension staff that Penn State can devote to that. So um, stay tuned. We'll let you know. It is my understanding that as long as you have a labeled product that includes the desired site, crop, et cetera, then you are good to go. Is that incorrect? This seems like an important point of clarification as the edge of the infestation moves west. Um, okay, and anybody else that wants to jump in here, I don't need to do all the talking, but I think that's gonna depend on your state. Um, as I mentioned, New York is a little more restrictive than other states. I work in both New York and Pennsylvania. And in New York, it has to have both the site and the pests that you're going after. Whereas in Pennsylvania, as long as it has the site. And when we talk about site, it's like um, grapes. If an insecticide is labeled for grapes, any insect pest in grapes, then you're able to use that for spotted lanternfly. Whereas in New York State, if you have an insecticide that's labeled for um, grape berry moth, the folks in Pennsylvania have shown that it works against spotted lantern fly, it still is not a legal application um, because it does not have spotted lantern fly on the label. So really that's going to depend on, I would contact your local extension folks in your state if you're not in New York um, to see what is labeled. 
There may not be labels for spotted lanternfly, but are there fungicides labeled for use on sooty mold? Not that I'm aware of, but anybody else? Marion or Julie? Hi, this is Juliet Carroll. Um, I don't believe that there are any fungicides labeled for use on sooty mold on plants. However, there may be fungicides labeled for use on painted surfaces, houses, and things like that to eliminate molds on those surfaces. My concern would be that even if you sprayed a fungicide on that honeydew covered surface, there would still be enough nutrient source for the fungi that they would not be adequately controlled, that sanitation and cultural practices would need to be coupled with something like that. But on plant material, on like crops, no, there are no fungicides that would be effective in controlling sooty mold. Any evidence of imidacloprid drenches being effective? I guess that's for the bug. Yep. Um, so, there's work being done. David Bid Dave Bittinger has done some work. Um, to what I could find in grapes, and it's not a drench, but um, a spray. And he found that Admire Pro provided 80% mortality um, the day of application, and that dropped to 48% seven days after the spray. So, but I know that they are looking at like um, Penn State and the USDA has looked at some treating Alanthus with different materials, the systemic. And I believe they used an imidacloprid drench on the tree of heaven. And it was mixed results. A lot of it had to do with the rainfall that you got to move it in. It wasn't the most effective um, management strategy. The spotted lanternfly vector flyer, fire blight or other bacterial diseases? Not that we are aware of. Are any vegetable crops specifically at risk? No. Does There's none that are yeah, none that are specific at risk, but like I said, if you have a vegetable um, field that is between the spotted lantern fly overwintering site or where they want to get to their um, preferred host, then you may find feeding on that. But chances are they are not going to stay there for an extended period of time. Does wild grape plant attract spotted lantern fly? Yes. We saw um, on the wooded edges, they will feed on the wild grapes just as much as the cultivated varieties. We have a time frame from infestation to mortality for shade or maple trees. Not that I'm aware of. I think a lot of that would have to do what um, I saw even in the vineyards when I was down there. Um, it didn't appear that spotted lanternfly by itself was um, having an effect, but it can lead to winter hardiness problems or problems with winter hardiness. Um, so if you get a very cold winter, um, you can have a plant die, but typically it's more than just feeding by spotted lanternfly. This is a quarantine question. What about travelers, tourists traveling from the quarantine area from Pennsylvania into New York? Yeah, so um, the quarantine does not distinguish between commercial traffic as well as just general public moving back and forth. The way that it's handled currently and the way that we um, enforce it is that um, there is a, a, a checklist uh, that Pennsylvania has for the general public. Um, they go through some training, they get that checklist, and then they have to self-inspect. Um, so they don't actually issue a permit, but they have that checklist, and, and we would check to make sure they have that. One of the things that I want to stress to everybody is that we are going to start to look at um, the campgrounds a little bit closer. Uh, we did some, some work in the campgrounds last year, but uh, 
you know, we want to, we want to pay a little bit closer attention to that. We do see a lot of boats coming up from the quarantine area into New York for fishing and other recreational activities. So that's one of the other things that we're looking at is in terms of our boat steward program that we have here in New York, uh, checking boats that are coming into, uh, into the different parks and, and uh, areas that they would be fishing or, or recreational use. So yes, the public is responsible for complying with the regulations. Um, they have a little bit different set of uh, hurdles to go through, but yes, they have to comply. And this is another quarantine question. We use a great deal of PA field landscaping in Maine. How can we be sure no egg masses are in the palletized stone? So I think the first step, as I indicated in the presentation, is to make sure that the company that you're dealing with out of the quarantine area is um, what we term compliant, and they're following the regulations. Uh, Pennsylvania, as well as other states, have postings on their uh, Department of Agriculture websites. Uh, I know Pennsylvania has a specific posting where they have all of the companies in Pennsylvania that have permits. So you can either check there or you can contact the company. Um, the second step in that is, um, when you get the paperwork um, that accompanies that shipment, there should be something there that talks about spotted lanternfly permit. Um, if you don't see that, um, you should contact us right away so that we can get that company into compliance, figure out what's going on with it. And then that should be a cue to you to further look at that material to see if you see any signs of spotted lanternfly, whether that be egg masses, nymphs, or adults, depending on the time of year. Stone is known to be a vector. That's how we believe it was brought into. Pennsylvania. We've seen it vectored on stone to other area, um, other areas, I should say. Um, and we do monitor stone yards. Um, we've been doing so for quite a while now. Um, but yes, I, those are, those are the steps that I would, I would encourage you to take and contact us if you see anything or you see an issue where there isn't compliance, where you're not seeing that certificate come through with the shipment. In the event your farm or property is found infested, does this prohibit the sale or sale viability of your crop? So right now, in and again, I'm speaking on in New York State, um, there is no regulation on an infested area. Every country doesn't have an infested area. Um, at the time that we find it, our, our steps would be to um, try and delimit the infestation. So we would go out and survey to see exactly what kind of area we're dealing with with an infestation. And then most likely there would be um, a discussion about placing a quarantine. But again, a quarantine does not shut down a business. What a quarantine does in, in terms of a plant pest is it puts some provisions in place that that business would have to adhere to to be able to get their product, in this case a crop, out of that quarantine area. Now, if you're talking about other states, um, you would have to abide by what that state is putting into place. Um, so in Pennsylvania, again, they have their sets of rules and regulations. New Jersey has theirs. And as it's being found, their quarantines are being expanded. Virginia does not have a quarantine, meaning Virginia itself. We have a quarantine on Virginia. Delaware is in the place of putting a quarantine. So if you're in Delaware, you want to check with that state. And again, it depends on the state. In New York, we're placing a quarantine on other states because we want to provide a level of protection to our growers and our industries here in New York. Uh, here's another quarantine question, Ethan. This is a, a PA question, so I'm not sure if you can answer. If a New York farmer is selling produce in Pennsylvania and they take the permitting test, is it good for the season or a certain number of trips? So I'm not sure about the length of the permit um, that Pennsylvania issues. I don't know if there's a duration. I would assume there probably is. Um, we typically, when we issue permits in New York, we have a duration of time that they're good for, um, but you would have to check on Pennsylvania's website. But for New York growers that are going down to participate in markets or deliver products into the quarantine area, you definitely want to have a permit in place so that you're compliant with our regulations and you're compliant with Pennsylvania's regulations. But you would have to check um, with Pennsylvania on what their duration is for their permit. If we are a teacher and want to bring back dead spot and lanternfly sample for education, is there anything special we need to do? Yes, yeah, so you have to have a permit first off to go down into the quarantine area. So yeah, any, any movement out of the quarantine area has to be permitted. So you have to go ahead and get that. Um, the, the, the next issue I have is, is what exactly do you want to bring back? If you're bringing back nymphs and adults that are dead, um, as long as you have a permit, there shouldn't be an issue. If you're looking to bring back egg masses, that is a cause for concern. Um, you want to make sure that those egg masses are properly treated. I would encourage you not to do that. Um, we are in the process of 
uh, creating displays for education um, for general public organizations as well as schools and um, with Cornell as well as DEC we're creating resin mounts so that you know the problem with spotted lanternfly is it's soft-bodied insect so it doesn't preserve well um, it's not like a beetle so putting it in a resin cast um, helps to preserve that um, and, and it makes it a lot easier to view other than putting it in a, a vial of alcohol so we're in the process of doing that stay tuned uh, we hope to have those resin casts uh, coming out this spring. Uh, could spot and lanternfly control tree of heaven from spreading in the landscape while excluding serious damage to other native species? Um, I don't know who wants to take that. I mean, I. I, tree of heaven is everywhere so it's not like yeah tree of heaven is everywhere is this a bio control for tree of heaven no. no um you know we're not the problem is is the feeding pressure for spotted lanternfly on trees um we haven't seen any um decline or death of trees um there's obviously damage and they're, and they're putting stress on the trees and there could be secondary things that come in to to further injure that tree and finish it off but as far as spotted lanternfly goes um, on Tree of Heaven, we haven't seen any death of Tree of Heaven because of it. This is Juliet Carroll. I'll just add to that conversation a little bit. There have been some attempts to manage this insect by uh, cutting out of a woodlot all but male Tree of Heaven trees and leaving only a few and then treating those with a systemic insecticide in an attempt to kill spotted lanternfly that are feeding on those trees. In some instances, the infestation on those trees has been significant enough that the tree is overwhelmed and uh, significantly damaged, if not killed. So although that was potentially a hopeful means of reducing the population of this insect and potentially reducing its spread in areas where there was a lot of tree of heaven in woodlots. Uh, that does not seem to be necessarily a, a good approach. Keep in mind that, yeah, if it feeds on these trees, it's going to be removing carbohydrate that the tree and amino acids as, as uh, Tim mentioned nitrogen that the tree needs to store as starch to overwinter when a tree grows in the spring, whether it's an apple tree, a hop vine, a grapevine, whatever. When it starts to grow in the spring, all of that flush of growth initially is built from overwintering stored carbohydrate that is in the wood of the tree and the roots of the tree until the leaves emerge and are large enough to start to photosynthesize. So if the tree is robbed of those nutrients by the insect infestation, as Tim mentioned, it's going to be less capable of overwintering, more susceptible to winter injury, cold snap damage, and likely much less thrifty, and there will likely be re reduced return bloom or reduced cropping on that seriously infested tree. So yeah, it could be a biocontrol for Tree of Heaven, but I wouldn't count on it. I think Nancy chimed in and said, Tree of Heaven is, is distributed far and wide. Yeah, and just to, just to jump in on what Juliet's saying is that, that that control measure is what's being implemented in the core area in Pennsylvania. That's Pennsylvania's um, management plan is to remove uh, Alanthus. Um, I think their, their percentage is 90% of Alanthus and leaving 10%, as she mentioned, of, of the males uh, and using those as sink trees. In other words, the, the, the spotted lanternfly would migrate to them and then treating those trees. Now on the, on the outer edge of the infested area, USDA who handles that um, is not doing that same practice. They are treating all of the tree of heaven. Um, so there's a little bit different um, ideologies in terms of management within the quarantine area. And um, I'm looking forward to being at the summit in Harrisburg to hear how those two management strategies are playing out in terms of managing spotted lanternfly in, in, the, uh, in the infested area. 
And I'm going to make a suggestion here, uh, since we have a lot of questions which we anticipated, um, that there is, uh, if all the panelists can click on the Q&A box, you'll see the questions there and there are. Um, and there's actually only one more that hasn't been answered. Oh, okay. I was going to say, because I was just, it looks like there's a- I'm not typing in the answers, but they oh. are answered. Okay, great. All right. Well, then I will, I will be quiet. <laughs> I'm not typing them in because there's too much. I, I couldn't keep up with that. No, doing that. As long as they're being answered <laughs> online, that's enough. So the last question I have uh, is, I think there is an apprehension or fear among growers about what the state will do to their farm if they find and report to the state. Can you outline what the state does to inspect for, remove, and follow up on reported spotted lanternfly incidents on farm? What is the state doing to help assuage growers' fears? Yeah, so that's always a concern by growers in the state in terms of our regulatory action. It's been something that I've dealt with in my career for a long time. Growers are always he hesitant to report it to us because they're fearful of what we're going to do. Um, I think with spotted lanternfly, um, if you find a dead spotted lanternfly, I think you know most likely what's going to happen is we're going to look at how that probably got there, and we're going to look at the shipment in, and that's that's what's happened in almost all the cases. You know, you saw those yellow counties. Um, some were associated with movement of plant material, and, but many were not. And so those businesses were not shut down. Basically what we were looking at was shipping records. How did it get there? Dealing with the company that shipped, dealing with the state in which it came from and trying to get compliance so that we don't get spotted lantern flying in New York and, and not reporting is probably more damaging, um, than, than, than reporting it, um, out of fear. Um, so I think the other, the other concern, um, that you have is, you know, what's going to happen to your business if we find it. Um, so like I said, you know, we would want to figure out if there's an established population and that would go through a survey. Um, and we would be surveying, um, the, the, the area around that business. Um, and that may be a grower, that may be a commercial business, whatever it may be, uh, to see if there's an infestation in the environs. Um, and then in terms of getting your product out, it would, it would be a matter of an inspection. Now, um, that could be depending on the commodity that could be an inspector going in and physically looking at the, at the product. It could be a compliance agreement, which is something that we've used historically with other big programs such as, um, Emerald Ash Borer, Asian Longhorn Beetle, Plumpox Virus, Golden Nematode, to name a few, um, where we put the responsibility back onto the grower or the business. If we feel that we have a good comfort level and they're responsible and they're trying to do the right thing, which most growers do, um, we, we'll put together some terms and say, okay, this is what we need you to do, and we leave it to you and we'll spot check you. Um, so it's not like you have an inspector sitting in your establishment constantly to inspect every load that goes out. Um, there are certain practices that are in place by certain businesses that already eliminate um, the spread of certain pests. And so we'll take that into account and, and look at that in terms of issuing the compliance. So there's a lot of different factors to weigh in. I think the, the most important point is um, if for some reason you know that there's an infestation, you don't want to be the person sitting on that information because it's not only going to affect you, but it's going to affect everybody else around you and create a bigger issue. And the key point here is to find it early enough so that we can manage it and we can treat it and hopefully deal with that early on. Because if we let it get bigger, then we have a much bigger problem and a much bigger expense on our hands to try and deal with it. And many more people will be impacted than just a few. And one more did come in. Will a car wash remove egg mass from vehicles? So this is something that I've, I, I've heard some discussion about down in the quarantine area. Um, you know, that, that covering that Tim talked about it is pretty tough. Um, and some of the females um, are not covering their egg masses for whatever reason. Um, and so if the covering is on it, it's very hard to remove that. Um, you really need to physically get close to that egg mass with that power washer and get that off. If you're just going through an automated car wash, most likely not. Um, and again, if you ever see videos of people trying to scrape this, they have scraper cards and they're physically really scraping hard to try and get that egg mass off. Tim, I don't, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, that I was right there with you. That um, I think might have something to do with when the egg mass was laid. So if it hasn't hardened yet, then 
you might be able to do it. And then later in the season, I didn't mention this, but as we get into the spring, that covering actually starts to um, erode or wear off, and then the eggs hatch. But I agree with Ethan, um, if you have ever seen people try and remove that, they do, it's just like a credit card, big plastic scraper, and um, it does take some effort to remove that. So I wouldn't count on running it through an automated car wash to do it. So we've had a few requests for uh, the presentation to be made available. Um, is that something we can do or work on? Sure, I actually have a half hour presentation that um, I have available for folks if they would like that, that kind of gets rid of the question slides and all the other things. So they could feel free to email me. Great. And um, Nancy, so you did have did one question on temperatures for the for egg, the low temperature survival of egg masses, but I don't know if we know the answer to that one. Um, so that's a little bit of a gray area. There is some Korean research, South Korean research, that talks about viability of egg masses based on cold temperatures. There's some gaps in that research, um, but there is some some indication that cold temperatures, and I can't remember the degrees, we can get those for you, um, would have an impact on egg masses. Tim, do you, do you remember the degrees and the duration that was in that Korean research? Yeah, um, I don't, not necessarily that, Ethan, but I was just looking at a paper the other day where they said, if your average winter temperature is 6.9 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, that the um, chance of overwintering is greatly reduced. So depending, I mean, you can get to 30 below, but is that 30 below once every 10 years or, so I think if you start getting into Northern Maine, you might be at that point where number one, tree of heaven isn't going to be um, a plant that survives. And that when you do get those really cold temperatures, it may um, at least, provide some mortality to spotted lantern fly eggs. Right. So and there was a question on mail ordered plant material, which I would think would also come under the quarantine. Yeah, so mail ordered plant material, regardless of where it comes from, still falls under Article 14. It has to have a certificate of inspection. Any plant material coming into the state has to have that. If it's coming from a quarantine area, then it has to have uh, an additional certificate or permit from that state department of ag of wherever it's coming from so there's you know just keep in mind any plant material shipped in the state has to have that that base level of certificate of inspection and then if it's coming from a quarantine area then they require to have an additional um, permit or certificate of inspection for spotted lantern fly yeah regardless if it's mail order online whatever the case may be there's also a question whether mating disruption might work on this pest this is um, an area where I think probably the answer is no, because we don't have any pheromone baited traps for these for this insect. Tim, do you know anything more about uh, mating disruption and spotted lanternfly? Um, just from what I've heard from the PA researchers is that pheromones aren't common in plant hoppers. Uh, they haven't been able to find them. So uh, mating disruption probably is not going to be a management method. Although they have, they are looking at some materials. Um, they use the bands to trap the, excuse me, they use tree bands to capture the nymphs as they crawl up and down the trees and they're looking at some materials that they can impregnate those with or use in association with them to attract. So it would be attractants more than just a pheromone product. And I, is, go ahead, Tim. Well, I just saw, I saw a question about whether the webinars, there's three more webinars and whether um, future webinars would be the same or more informative. And I would say that this afternoon's webinar um, for grapes and apples will be similar, but
but um, we will have Dan Gilrain, Betsy Lamb, and Brian Eschnauer will be the presenters, and Ethan, um, for the ornamentals, landscape, and Christmas tree webinars. So those might be worth tuning into because they'll probably be much more informative. Great. So, so before, uh, before we leave, Jan, I just had another comment. There was a question about organic management of this insect. And so I took some time to look up the, uh, my, the biological control that's labeled for use against plant hoppers. It doesn't have a FIFRA 2EE for use in New York State, um, but the active ingredient is Bovaria bassiana, which I think is the, the uh, fungus that Tim had pictures of that basically looks like the, fun the insect turns white with the growth of the fungus. Um, so some of those formulations might be OMRI approved, but whenever you're dealing with organic products and whether you're organic certified, really the, ant the question should be posed to your certifier, the person who is maintaining or auditing you for organic certification. They will have the specific answers for you as it relates to any of these materials. And of course, state by state, that may be different. Certifier by certifier, that might be different. But um, there may be a Mycotrol or Botanigard formulation that is OMRI approved. But the efficacy of those biocontrols can vary significantly with the weather conditions in the year that they might be applied to those insects. Great. So by my reckoning, it looks like there may have been uh, 16 questions that may not have been answered completely directly. And uh, so what I'm going to suggest is uh, I will uh, make a note of those questions and ask our uh, panelists to, um, to type answers for them. And then I can send those to people too. And some of them may have been covered uh, with some of the answers. And so it might not be necessary, but um, it was just, I just want to make sure that uh, people do get their questions answered. So those will be emailed out to you. And um, so thank you for all the people who have been with us uh, for, for all this time. And I um, and, uh, look forward to sending the recording to you. And thank you to all the present presenters for all of the career and effort and, and uh, education that has gone into your capacity to, to be here today and answer these questions. So. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.